I'm Carol Stewart. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Black Northern Women, along with my sister Maxie, who is around, and Jacqueline, who's around as well. And we, we started this event in um, 2019 when we had our first conference. Because we recognised that there was a lack of these sorts of events for black women in the north of England. A lot of empowerment conferences and so forth were looking authentic, and we recognised that you know, black women in the north may be even more sort of isolated from each other, so we want to a way of bringing everybody together. Just to celebrate, to connect, to make friends, to make form collaborations, and just to uplift and inspire each other. And so, this was the 2019, and each year has got better and better. Um, and this year, we have to give a lot of thanks to the Sheffield Hallam University, who have let us use this venue. Without that, we may not have been able to, to go ahead. And um, so, well, there's no one from here at the moment from the university, but I just want to acknowledge that Sheffield Hallam University has been a great support to us for this event. Um, and so, We've got a great lineup today. We've got interactive discussions, we've got some a fun activity, we've got some network, speed networking with the kids, and we've got our keynote speaker, Angie Lamar, who is somebody who has been around for many years, and she's quite an icon when it comes to black British women in terms of her successes and achievements. And one of the things that I find when it comes to black women who, well, that holds them back from achieving their full potential, both professionally and personally, is fear and lack of confidence. And oftentimes, that has arisen because of early life experiences where we've been made to feel that we're not good enough. It could be because we're living in an environment where we're the minority, um, because of the colour of our skin, because of our hair. We weren't seen as the ideal of the community. We weren't seen as being as good as, as other people. And for many of us, that we've carried that over the years, and it's affected us in terms of how we see ourselves as adults. And I myself can relate to that because as a child growing up in Sheffield, I was the only black girl in my class. And I remember when I was about eight years old, me and, my, me and me and my friends, like right friends, we, we went through a phase of playing the game where I always had to be the servant. And at the time, you know, we, we were friends, and the black kids and the white kids, they played happily together, a group in Hunter's Bar, where there was, although there wasn't a great deal of black people, there was a very tight knit community, and also, like I said, the black kids, the white kids, the Asian kids, we all played happily together. And none of us knew about racism, but there was racism and racist undertones in the way that we played. So the game that we played that I had to be the servant, even though my friends probably didn't think that they were doing anything wrong, as an adult I see that that was rooted in racism. And I remember I used to, I used to say, why do I always have to be the servant? Um, and so we'd say, you take a vote. You took a vote, and of course, Everybody voted for me to be the servant. And to me, that was learned behaviour. So they were only acting on what they had learned. And when now, they probably be quite horrified at that. And so messages like those, when you're constantly hearing those sorts of messages, it instills in you a feeling that you're not as good as other people. And, and that was the case for me, growing up into my adulthood. I, I lacked self-belief and I lacked confidence. Now, I would say that I'm a very confident person now, um, both confident, part of who I am, um, but I had to work on my self-development over the years to get to a place where I accepted myself as I was and that I was good enough um, and had that belief in myself that even though my skin may be a different colour, my hair may be a different type, I'm just as good as everyone else. And I would like to encourage all of you that you are good enough, that you are enough, and that you are fabulous, you are brilliant, you are amazing, we all are. Whether we are black, whether we are white, whether we are Asian, we all are. And sometimes we just need to look beyond that, look beyond the beliefs that have shaped our thinking, challenge our thoughts and beliefs about ourselves. And so we all, 
fearful or lacking confidence in becoming who you know you can be and being the best you, challenge your thoughts and beliefs that you have about yourself because they're very much led by our emotions and the way that we think affect how we feel and many of us act and behave according to how we're feeling. And that's because of the thoughts and beliefs that we have about ourselves, the environments we're in and the situations that we find ourselves in. But if you can change what you think and believe about yourself, you change how you feel. You change how you feel, you change how you act and behave. And you will be bolder, confident and fearless. So that's enough for me. I'd like to introduce my co-host, Alex, who's that over there. She's hosting the day with me. So we're going, we're going to start off with a panel discussion. And we're going to be talking about um, overcoming bias. So the panel we're going to share how they can overcome bias as a result of their race and gender. Then we're going to have a, a speed networking event. And then we will have lunch. No, we'll have a break after the discussion. Then we'll have lunch. And then when we come back, we've got an energizer fun activity. And then we've got another panel discussion, and then we've got Angie, the keynote speaker. So, once again, thank you everybody for coming. I look forward to speaking to you all throughout the day, and I hope that you enjoy yourself, and I hope that you make friends, form collaborations, and network as well. So, I'm happy to call OJ up, and the first panel speaker. She was at the very first event. She was at the, the last live event that we had and she facilitated the panel discussion. discussion. And I remember at the time I said, oh, put that a watch now. Because she had a few she entertained us. Well, you're going to get a taste of her now. So I'm going to hand it over to Oh, Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? You need to hear me. Because my name is Oge and I am remarkable. And for some of you, as you listen to that, thank you for the, for the appreciation. You will appreciate that. For some of you, it might actually trigger you, and that's okay. And for some of you, you might want some of that. So I'm going to introduce you to my philosophy right now as we start, which is that we create ourselves as we go along. And I am is the most powerful thing you can say as you begin. So I want to introduce you to that concept of I am today, so that you get to choose what you're going to take away from today. Your concept might be, I am curious. It might be, I am inspired. It might be I am sarcastic. <laughs> it's completely up to you. But what I'm inviting you to do as we listen to our panelists today is that you get to choose how you receive what is delivered today. So, once again, I am OK and I am remarkable. Thank you. Are remarkable panelists. <laughs> I've created you in that way, by the way. <laughs> you get to create what you want, but I am creating you guys as remarkable today. That you can also do. You can create me in whatever way you want to. It does not affect who I am. I can create you in whatever way I want to. It does not affect who you are. Okay? So our first panelist is Tanya. Cooley. 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 As you said, one of the ways I'm going to invite you to introduce yourself is with your I am. I want to know what you're saying to me. I am terrific. Oh. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and then we have Ursula Maury. 
my Miley. Was panicked. My heart was beating. 
It's just going to end words, and he was calling me all these awful, awful words. And I turned my back, and I ran up that street. I was petrified. Luckily for me, while I was down there, I was on a visit with a colleague, and the colleague I knew who I just left him. So I ran up that street, and my colleague got in his car and was just about to drive away. And I was able to bang on the car to get his attention to stop him, and he stopped. My managers, they didn't support me. They didn't support me because they knew I was a troublemaker, because my mouth was too big. So I took six months to leave and I stayed at home and I gave it to God and I said, I need to do something. And God had the plan. It all mapped out and He does it, but you've got to see it for yourself. But when I started to see it and believe it, I made my plan. And I applied to go to university to do a multimedia course in journalism. I, I applied to go to university, so now I'm at university studying journalism. I was determined that I was going to achieve what I need to achieve in life. 
When I came here, my grand kept taking me to these houses, and I keep seeing these pictures on the wall of everybody wearing this cap and gown thing. And I always looked at it and said, you know what, one day, one day, I am going to achieve that. I am going to be that picture on the wall. Standing there, sitting there, or whatever it is, but I'm going to do it. So fast forward all the way through, 2016, I gave up my job in local government for 12 years, and I started university. When I started university, it was a struggle then, because being out of the academic and not for such a long time, it took me a long time to get back into things. Got back into it, and when I got back into it, it was amazing, I started enjoying it. By the age of 41, the last few weeks of my degree, I was diagnosed with dyslexia and dyspraxia. Regardless of that, I went through and achieved a first class honours degree. So that's what I So I was living in Birmingham at the time 
and I applied, and the only place that they had was Manchester. And I thought, goodness sake, I don't want to move to Manchester. And um, and I'm an only child to my mom, so that was really hard for me to leave. But my mom said, you've got to do whatever it is that you need to do. And the scripture that she gave to me, and he held on to me, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And that's what he did. And when I left, Manchester many moons ago, believe you or not. Um, <laughs> I left and uh, my plan was to go back to Manchester, to Birmingham afterwards. And my husband met me and fell in love. We married them 20 years this year, two amazing oh, children. Wow. And, um, I went to university, I graduated, I became a teacher, and I was a lecturer for 15 years. And this was one of my places that I used to teach. I was a, an associate lecturer for Sheffield Hallam University. And I did it when I do amazing things because I said to myself, plan it, see it, anticipate it. It will happen. And I thought, you know what? You're going to hear me roar. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to say anymore. I'm going to do the things that I wanted. So in 15 years, I had an amazing time there, but I never got promoted in 15 years. Years. I got bypassed of all the promotions, everything you could, never got it. And I just thought, how is this possible? I know I'm good at what I'm doing. I have a degree, I have the education, the experience, but I'm just getting passed over. And I thought, what am I going to do? And in 2018, I decided, do you know what I'm going to do? As Earl Nightingale said, instead of competing, create. So I created my own job. I handed in my notes in 2018, of the summer, I wrote my first open doors, and from there subsequently I've done four publications. I'm now a book publisher and helping other people publish their books. And I left there, never turned back, and now I have my own business, and it's soaring. So I'm encouraging you all to plan it, Plan on what you want to do, see it, we visualize and anticipate it, know that it's going to happen. Plan it, see it, anticipate it. school friends. It begins in the home. 
That's that's my been my experience. I am a historic rape and sexual abuse survivor. I, my my abuse began in Jamaica when I was three years old. I was born here but sent to Jamaica from the age of two to six. I was raped and sexually abused. When I came here, my own mother used to schedule the leaders of the church to come in the house and rape me under the guise that they were raping the demons out of me. That was my childhood. Based on all these things, bias. Discrimination, because I was too black, I was too ugly, I was too badly behaved. I saw my first black man at seven. I started cussing when I was seven. By the time I was nine, I was a full blown alcoholic. How did I manage to break the vice? It was when I was 33 years old when I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. I've never heard of it. Up until then, I've been sectioned multiple times. Many suicide attempts, spent my childhood in hospital with broken bones because my mother was that woman that would leave with whatever was at hand. In the moment, you didn't wash your dish properly, grab Dutch off, both. There goes your head. So I spent my childhood in that hospital. I was put into care for over two and a half years. I'm one of the Shirley Oaks survivors. For those of you who don't know what that is, Shirley Oaks is one of the worst sexual abuse cases in the history of this country. There was over, there's over 2,000 of us now that are known as the Shirley Oaks abuse survivors because in care we were raped and sexually abused by the people who were running the care home. But at 33, when I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, I want to say this to people, don't be afraid of labels. Not all labels are bad. Because if I hadn't had that label of, of uh, borderline personality disorder, I went home, I Googled it, never heard of it before in my life, I was tick, 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 that's me, that's me, that's me, that's how I came, that's how I came. I call my kids and girls, come look at this. And I'm like, really, that's you. That's you, mom. you behave like that. You um, are very direct. You don't have a gray area in your head. You only see black and white. That's you, mom. And that was when I realized that me being told from the wall that my mental health was demonic possession, voodoo, witchcraft, evil eye, black magic, orbia. That was when I realized it wasn't any of those things. A borderline personality disorder develops in children as a result of sexual abuse and trauma in, 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 in sexual abuse and trauma in childhood. And with that diagnosis, with that label, I was able to break the bias. Break everything that I've been told. I don't socialize and I don't really work with people. I don't understand social cues and inability to do that. And I decided, you know what, I'm now going to fix myself and go within myself and break the bias of what I've been told that I can't and I won't and I will never. And, and today I am the founding member of an organization called Admira, which is a survival and mental health and wellbeing service that specifically supports black people with mental health issues. The modern day Harriet Tubman, who, when she escaped slavery, she didn't think to herself when she escaped, oh my God, I'm now going to go into my best life. She went back and started another underground railroad and went back and found people coming behind her, just like her, on the same journey. And that's what I chose to do. I chose to do what I call recycle. You can let that trauma, that pain, that bias, that racism in your own home, in childhood, kill you or you can recycle it and turn it into something positive and it's not easy. I did it. I broke the cycle of abuse. I never abused my kids the way I was abused. I broke the cycle, but it cost me multiple breakdowns. And I'm going to finish with this. Many times, I was a section here in Sheffield. I've been section for years. I've sectioned many times in London, in the Morsi Hospital in London. And guess who recently emailed me and asked me to come and be a speaker? at their facility, the Morsley Hospital. Yes. Never ever think that you cannot break the virus. You can't.
Sometimes the best response is silence. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to open up to the panel now. We've got some questions, and then we will open up to you as well. Uh, as we've already started that, but I wanted to start this conversation with what does bias mean to you personally? Because it's a personal thing. It can be a personal thing too. There is a dictionary description, there is a policy description, and there is a personal description. What does that mean to you personally? Anyone? And as personally, one word is unfair. Not being seen. Not being seen. Yeah. Who wants to share? What does bias mean to you? Just one word. One word. Anybody would like to share? I asked you guys to sit here. <laughs> <laughs> My manager 
an email. And I opened this email, it was a housing association, a big housing association I was working for. I opened this email, I still remember, I was in North London at the time, and I thought, really? And there was no thought to it. I responded to her, CC'd all her managers in, and it was basically an out of here. And that was it. There was just nothing else to it. Sometimes you just shut the door on the door. Yeah. Thank you. Mine's a similar story. I've uh, been in education for 15 years, and I've got promotion. And like Peter was saying, you know, we don't compete. I, I, I decided not to compete, I just thought, okay. Um, so I created my own job. 2018, of the summer, I handed in my notice, and my teachers were saying, Are you sure? And I said, Oh, yeah. And it will work if you work it. And I made it work because I was not going back. Thank you. Um, there's a saying that I love that says, be, um, be careful that you don't become what you fear or what you hate. And because of what I experienced as a child, I was, my mother was wrong racism in the so I was told by a real white man, <laughs> you know, she would, she would kill us um, for something like that. So by the time I became an adult, I had a massive chip, several chips, two trunks, and a tree on both shoulders by the time I left. And when it's, the question is where we experience bias, you have to be careful that you don't become what you hate. Mm. Because we can accuse white people and everybody else who's not black of racism and bias, but have we checked within ourselves? And I'm saying that where I've experienced bias, I can give you 10,000 stories, but I can also give you stories of where I have been the one portraying the bias. My work brings me into rooms with very influential, very powerful. Whether we're doing it uh, consciously or I know that I have because when you change and you start noticing everyone around you changing, it's like, oh my god, I can actually change this. I can actually change this. So my question to our panelists is following up on that, how do we as black people perpetuate this negative bias in our families and in our cultures? It kind of stems from what we've been and how when you go back to the role in the family, where you're treated in your family, the favoritism that can be traced as well, when you go back to the colouring thing as well, the massive thing in our community about colour, a massive thing about colour is you like to skin people that are more being inferior than people who are not. So it does exist and as we say, it's important for us to start and look at ourselves and see where it's coming from because chances are it's been in, in, you know, in depth from, yeah, maybe from a very, very young age and it's hard to, sh to you know, shut it off when it's in all family. It's difficult because it's how you can't say, I don't want anything to do anymore because it's a hard call. Yeah, it is. Yeah. At least we begin to become aware of it. So thank you for bringing that up because Awareness for me is the first step. You, you, it's very difficult to change what you're not aware of. Once you're aware of it, you can begin to do something about it. Thank you. Yeah, just like Keisha was saying, it's about our language and the way that we speak, and it's being like to aware of how we speak. And I always say to my clients, it's about rejecting the place. So it's about rejecting those negative words and replacing them with something positive. And it's catching yourself, speaking those negative things, and then not saying it. always says, if you have anything good to say, don't say it. So it's about so holding that and then reframing the language and using something else that's positive. Because, like I said before, there's life and death in the power of the tongue. So you have to be careful because our words, it's so important to elevate instead of tearing each other down, which I think is very important. Um, I remember when I was brave enough to go and ask my mom, I think I was 20 or 21, why? Why did you do those things? Why did you allow those things to happen? And my mother said to me, I didn't know any better. That's how my mother did me. And if you meet my grandmother, she's nearly 100, she's the most bitter, angry, hateful woman you will meet. And if you go back and back, it's generational. Mm -hmm. It's generational. Break the generational cycle. Yeah. 
but don't get it twisted. It's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. And Angela Maya said, when you know better, you do better. Do better. Yeah, man. But it's not that simple. No, it's not. Acknowledge that it is generational, especially in our black communities. And you have to break that cycle of abuse. And that might mean facing the thing that caused the abuse, facing the person that caused the abuse. When you're ready, when you're strong enough to do that, because we're talking on respect. You know, talk about dear mother. You know, I'm 49, I just taught my kids, if my mother bumps me, me I hold it. If she slap me, I'm holding it because as much as I don't like a woman, she's my mother. And it's that respect thing. So don't, you know, it's like go and break the cycle, but not everybody's strong enough to do that. And what are the consequences? The wider consequences. You say it, but sister don't believe, brother don't believe, uncle say you're a liar, not it. Mm-hmm. Everything needs to have a balance in context. Mm-hmm. Hello everyone, my name is Chico. Um, and I just wanted to share a bit about how, so my mom was a divorcee, but she got divorced at a time when it wasn't actually accepted to be divorced, you know, in the early 70s. And she had four young children. And she decided to leave my father because he was being unfaithful. Um, and she, and this was back in Zimbabwe, by the way, so it was not a bad thing to leave your husband. You need to stay with your husband. Because that's what I'm going to do. But she stood up for herself and she said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I think growing up with such a strong woman, in our own house, like how we're saying that it's all in the house, I saw how she broke bias. She was a nurse, she drove a car, she was an old woman, she had a business. And I remember as a teenager, I used to call her my nickname for her was Lady Liberty because she, I could see how free she was. She could do what she wanted. She was a strong lady. And that's what I'm saying. I think that in the house, some, as strong women, we can break it as well. Yeah. Yes, by choosing ourselves first. Thank you. Let his hands up. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Patricia. Hi. Um, 
I just wanted to add to something that Ursula was saying earlier. It can be a very long, very complex, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, but Ursula was talking about when you feel ready to confront the person that you have the experience with. So I'd just like to add that when you do feel ready, um, any behavioural exposure is really, really important that it's planned. And so when you're planning how or you're, you're going to speak to this person, it's useful to think about where. Um, because that really makes the difference. I confronted my mother and I decided that I was going to meet her in a very public place because I knew the character and the personality and I knew what would happen if it was private. So if you're going into a public place, there's less likely for um, the kind of reaction that I feared. So I met her in a cafe and I asked somebody to drop her off at that cafe and I spoke to her in that cafe, and then I rang the person and asked them to come and pick her back up. So I think real thought is important when you're going to approach um, any kind of behavioral exposure such as that. Yeah. Thank you.
that has really, really intensive discussions. Thank you all for sharing your stories. Thank you all for listening and engaging. Renee Marvel, give it all a round of applause.